Welcome to the Heart Health Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Menolosino, Medical Director of the Mental Clinic Center for Functional Medicine in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This is your chance to hear from international experts on how to optimize your health, your vitality, and prevent heart disease. We're joined today by Dr. Ben Lynch, one of my colleagues, one of my experts in the field that I look up to, and someone who's become a friend for me. Thank you for joining us, Ben. Hey, my pleasure, Mark. Good to be here. And uh, Wyoming is on my list. I got to get out there. Well, we'll take your, you and your boys right there. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm down. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. So let me tell our viewers a little bit about you, Ben. Um, again, uh, Ben and I got the chance to sit next to each other at a conference, and I've always wanted to meet him. I've heard him lecture, watched his webinars and, and podcasts. And uh, I was really, really enjoyed our time together and, and talking about our kids and our passion for sports and the outdoors. And we seem to have a really similar value-based system. And I, I really respect that in my colleagues. So Dr. Ben Lynch, he's the best-selling author of Dirty Genes and president of Seeking Health. It's a company that helps educate both the public and health professionals on how to overcome genetic dysfunction. He received his doctorate in naturopathic medicine from prestigious Bastyr University. He lives in Seattle, Washington with his wife and three sons. He has a special interest in environmental medicine, and it's really trying to help people recover from the assaults of chemicals, heavy metals, and other environmental toxins. For all of my colleagues, Dr. Ben is the go-to guy to help us untangle this web of genetic intricacy, personalizations, and how to really optimize everyone's individual health by looking at their uniqueness. So again, Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. It's awesome to hear. It's a, you're doing a great thing helping these ladies figure out what's going on and prevent their heart health issues. So let's, let's get into it. Well, you know, I, I think all of us in this passion field of integrative naturopathic functional medicine, we all have kind of a story of why we got interested in a part of it that we become experts in. Can you share with us what what was the, the, the aha moment for you that you knew genetics were where you wanted to become the expert? Well, it was a, there was not one incredible aha moment, but there was, there was, you know, it's funny how when you're going through life, there's something that says, oh, that's really interesting and really cool. And then something later, maybe a year or two or a few years later, it's like it builds on it, mm -hmm. builds on it, builds on it. So there is, there is a few. I remember I was working with Dr. Bill Ray in texas at the environmental health center dallas uh it was amazing doc environmental medicine and we were treating individuals for you know mold or heavy metals or uh indirect uh meth exposure you know because they were cooking it somebody was cooking it downstairs and all wow. the fumes came up upstairs um so we we saw a lot of weird crazy stuff and so with these people we were treating them the same way as all the other patients who had you know, indirect meth exposure or heavy metals or chemical toxicity or what have you. Some got better, some didn't. And I remember I asked Dr. Ray, I said, do you think there's a genetic component to this? And he goes, yeah, probably, but I haven't really ever looked into it because it's, you know, it wasn't really available, the technology, so I never looked at it. So that kind of was stuck in my head. And I saw the tale of two mice uh, on Nova. So if you Google Nova, tale of two mice, you will see the same video that I saw and you'll go, oh my gosh, when you have genetically identical mice built and bred for heart disease um, and diabetes and cancer, and the controls ended up getting those things, and the rats that ended up having methylated nutrients like folate and B12 did it. And I was like, wait a minute, hold on, you're telling me the genetically identical mice for heart disease? never got it because they were given a few vitamins. Wow. I mean, that, that really changed my mindset. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I, I really got into it from there. I, I've seen that clip and the mice are actually different. They look different after yes. they're, they're uh, exposed to those nutrients. And that's the power of food as medicine. You know, Ben, a lot of people come to see me and say, oh, my mom has Alzheimer's. My dad has heart disease. I'm just doomed to get those too. Mm -hmm. And this new concept of epigenetics is you're not your parents at all. You have the power to change that. Yeah. Yeah. You're not your parents. You're not your brother. You're not your sister. And, uh, and in fact, you're still you, but you can be a new you. Hmm. And so if you are already having heart disease, you know, 
oftentimes you can reverse that, which is awesome. Even calcifications in your, in your blood vessels, you can change, right? Yes. So, you know, even if you think that, oh, I'm already having these things and your genes are dirty and they're, they're contributing to these problems, your choices are either going to support your genetic expression or they're going to hinder it. And every day we make these choices back and forth and it's like, oh, I want that. It's going to taste really good and it's going to make me feel really good. I know I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it. And then you say, okay, well, now that I did that, you know, I'm going to go and, and uh, you know, take a sauna or go exercise or what have you. So, you know, there's, there's the yin and yang. So, you know, you, and I, I'm not perfect by any means. And I, I don't think that uh, we should get stuck in the ideology that we have to be absolutely perfect with every single choice because that's a stressor in and of itself. Sure. But yes, we absolutely are our own unique selves. And even if your parents or your loved ones have cardiovascular disease that you're related to closely, does not mean you're next in line. Well, you know, you, you mentioned this concept of dirty genes. And, and uh, c- can you help our viewers understand what's the difference between, uh, is there a difference between a clean gene and a dirty gene? Or when you say the dirty genes, what's the concept that you like to share with that? Yeah, I, I asked my audience, you know, I was curious, you know, after I wrote the book, I asked them, what do you think a dirty gene is? And I got all these answers, like a SNP, um, a gene that's bad. Um, and there was one lady who goes, a gene that is not functioning optimally. And I, I love that. It's yeah. really simple, and it says it all. Because you can be born with perfect genes. I mean, an absolute specimen. And they can come to you clinic and say, Doc, you know, Dr. Mark, look at my genetic test. And you're like, wow, your genes are perfect. And it's like, really? There's nothing you can do for me? Well, just because your genes are perfect does not mean they're working perfectly. Oh, that's great. So, you know, well, let's, you know, it's good that you have, you know, your genes are clean, you know, genetically from, you know, you inherited great genes from your parents. The problem is your choices or your exposures in your life or your stressors have overwhelmed your genes, even though they were, you know, built to sustain and, you know, and keep off a lot of pressures. So you're fortunate because otherwise you'd probably be dead by now. (laughs) You've got great genes, but we've got to clean them up. And so by cleaning up your genes, what you're doing is you're doing the fundamentals. You're doing eating a good diet. You're, You're finding stressors and eliminating them or reducing them. And stressors can be relationships. It can be overtraining. It can be undertraining. It could be not sleeping deeply enough. It can be an infection. It could be heavy metals, chemicals, and so on. So you do the fundamentals. So all I ever say is, and Dr. Tom O'Brien says the same thing, when you have a, a genetic variation, like MTGFR is one such gene that is well known, when you find that you have an MTGFR gene, it does not mean that you are destined to have problems like cardiovascular disease or cancer or what have you. It just shows that you have increased susceptibility and you need to take extra precaution to it. So I, mean, I say a dirty gene can be inherited or it can be just brought on by your own lifestyle choices. And that's such an empowering concept. What you're really doing is you're, you're giving people information about themselves to empower them with knowledge, to help them to make behavioral changes to optimize their life. Yes. And you've got to have the information to know what to do with it, to know what choices are good or not so good for you uniquely. Absolutely. And when you, when you boil it down to the genetic level, and your own unique set of genes. What it does is it is the individual really takes ownership of that information. Whereas if you just go to a doctor and they say, look, your homocysteine is high, and they're like, I don't know what that is, and that's a cardiovascular risk factor, okay, and you need to take these vitamins, all right. But they don't really connect to it. When you show them and say, look, you have this particular set of genes that when they are not functioning very well, you have a potential for higher homocysteine. And what this means is if your homocysteine gets higher, then you have a lot of potential for cardiovascular disease and other things. So with your set of genes, we need to be keeping an eye on this closely. And so I've ordered that for you today, and we find that, yeah, your homocysteine is 15. So it shows that your genes are actually needing some extra attention. So... With that said, would you like to take some additional steps to support that? They're like, heck yeah. Mm-hmm. So, because now they're, 
they've really personalized it. And it's actually actionable. And that's yes. what I think has been so hard in the past with genes. And, you know, we've had other speakers talk about methylation, MTHFR, homocysteine. Do you have an easy way for our viewers to try to package what that means to them? Yeah. So, you know, you want to start with methylation? Sure. It's, it's just a, they're, they're hard concepts, I think, for a lot of people to put that whole story together. And once you get this story, then it's easier to parlay it like you did in your book. You're able to put all the other genes in a nice sequence that they're able to follow. That's right. So, you know, there's multiple, multiple actions that are going on in our body all the time. Like every millisecond, every nanosecond, there's some process going on. And one of these processes is called methylation. And when you hear the, the break the word apart, my grandfather always said, when you try to define something better, explain something, always define it. And that's such a great point. So Asian is, defines an action, right? Acceleration, you know, mastication is chewing. Um, excitation is being in the state of being excited. Methylation is the act of giving a methyl group to something else. And what's a methyl group? A methyl group is just a, a compound in the body that when it binds to something, it changes its function. That's it. It changes its job. So when my hand is shaped like this, I can catch a ball, okay? Or I can shoot a basketball, but I can't type. So I need to change the shape of how it's going. So now I can Great type, analogy. but I can't catch a ball. So if, let's say that this is your dopamine in your body, right? Your dopamine is shaped like this because compounds have unique shapes. So when you add a methyl group to it, let's say it now is like that. So that dopamine becomes something else, okay? So homocysteine, for example, does not have a methyl group on it. There's no methyl group on homocysteine. And homocysteine, we know, and you know very well in your clinic, and you probably even mentioned it in your book a number of times, that when homocysteine is high, there is, depending, you know, even research papers go back and forth on it, there is issues with cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. for various reasons. When you add a methyl group to homocysteine, it now becomes methionine, which is methylated homocysteine. And how do you get that methyl group onto homocysteine? From methylfolate, which is your body's number one form of folate, which your MTFR gene makes, or you consume from leafy veggies or organ meats. Ugh, um, but they're great. <laughs> and then there's methylcobalamin. You hear that? Methylcobalamin? You've been hearing these terms all the time, but you never took time to recognize that these support methylation. So methylfolate is a really good form of folate. Folic acid is not methylated, whereas methylfolate is and methylcobalamin is methylated, and these two nutrients help support taking homocysteine and making it uh, non-toxic for your body in, in healthy amounts. You know, I have a lot of people come in taking B12, and they're taking the cyanocobalamin. Yep. And really, really, you know, where you, whether you know your genes or not, is there a role for cyanocobalamin in anybody? No. There is, there is no physiological role for cyanocobalamin, and there's no physiological role for folic acid. These two compounds have to be transformed by the body in order to be utilized. And that's exactly my point with dirty genes. If you are consuming something that requires work by your genes, that's okay as long as they're not yeah. overworked. Mm -hmm. So when you're, you come home and you're, son or your daughter says, you know, mom, dad, can you help me with my homework? Sure. Then the next kid comes home. Dad, I got to go to practice. Your mom, I got to go to practice. And then the laundry piles up. Where are my socks? And then is dinner ready? And you're starting to go like that, right? <laughs> so your genes are the same way. So if you consume cyanocobalamin and you're consuming folic acid and you have high homocysteine and you didn't get enough sleep last night, and you have heavy metal toxicity, and you're taking medications like nitrous oxide from the dentist, and you don't have enough antioxidants like glutathione, your genes are gonna be like, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't work, and therefore your homocysteine levels get built up just like the laundry uh, buckets in the laundry room. They just can't do the work. You gotta free them up. Oh, you know, I love as a family man, the analogies you have that are so real world, you make it easy. Ben, you were kind enough to sign one of your books and give it to me at the conference we were at together to my yeah. nutritionist. I actually took it for the first several days and read it. I'd looked at it and kind of read it, but after meeting you, I went deep and read it. And 
you have so many great, easy to follow analogies. And I think that's something that really separates the good clinicians from the great ones is that they are able to take difficult concepts and make them understandable. And once people understand them, they actually are interested in doing something about them. What, yeah. in, what in this gene story for you is, has been the hardest for you to get or to explain to, to clients or um, to physicians? I would say that's a great question. There's a number of them. One I is thought that, there might be. <laughs> yeah, there's a number of them. And the, one is the internet. And, uh, you, know, you know, you can explain things as you, as you do in your book where you've done the research, you've done the homework, you've practiced and seen absolute results over and over and over again with your, your, with your patients. It's proven, there's no doubt, okay? The biggest problem I am seeing is I have this SNP, what do I do about it? What supplement do I take about with, for it? And they're not understanding that just because you have a SNP or a genetic variant does not mean that there's an issue. Right. Now, I was at fault for that for a couple of years when I was working with genetics myself. I would work with all individuals and they would have empty chafar, you know, heterozygous, homozygous, and I would vary my recommendation as a supplement based upon how significant their, their SNP was. And sometimes it worked beautifully, sometimes it backfired awfully, mm-hmm. horribly. And so then I came to learn, I was like, huh, well, your homocysteine is actually okay. Yeah, your MTGFR is 677 homozygous. It's pretty significant. Your MTGFR gene is slowed down. It's pretty dirty by about 80%, but you know, 20% of it's still functioning and you're not overwhelming it. So, and you're eating a lot of leafy greens, so you're fine. Don't need it. So it's, I would say the biggest one is don't treat the SNP and you know, make sure that you treat and support the individual. And you, even if you're not a doctor, please do not take your genetic report and say, what vitamin or supplement do I take? Because you can see that all over the internet. And yes, Facebook groups are fabulous, but they're also at the same time very time-sucking, and they can put you down rabbit holes and, and make you sicker than when you first got started. You get more confused. So I just don't treat the SNP. I think you're right, Ben. You know, Dr. Google can be a good thing, um, and Facebook, because it's great for people to get information. Yeah. It's how they package it and use it for themselves, it gets a little bit dicey. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, pulling something off the internet. I know you do some work where you help people to understand what these huge tests mean. Uh, What's the benefit of someone doing one of these genetic tests? And then what's the harm of them doing them? How can they best use that information? Well, that's a loaded question. I know. Good and loaded. (laughs) Um, First off, you have to ask yourself, are you ready to peek under your own hood? Are you Great ready question. to lift the skin off, you know, and, and look inside of your own body? So if you are willing to do that and you're excited to see, then go for it, okay? However, if it terrifies you to know which gen- genetics you have, then don't, because what you're going to do is you're going to focus and obsess over them, and it's going to create more fear, and that more fear is going to dirty your genes. So if you're ready, go. If you're not ready, just just don't. Or what you can do is you can do genetic testing and say, give it to your doc and say, doc, look at my genes, and you make the decisions for me, and then maybe at some point I'll be ready for it. But you have to be mentally ready. Now, that said, let's say you're excited to get your genetic testing done and peek under the hood. And you know, I equate this to being you know, we see outside of ourselves all the time, right? Mm -hmm. We can't see inward. We always see outward. We can try to think inwardly, but you know, that's tough, but we can't see our own genes. When you, when you do a genetic test, you basically find out if you are a Prius, uh, you know, a front wheel drive car, a rear wheel drive car, a four wheel drive car, low clearance. You can, you, your acceleration is zero to 60 in 10 seconds or zero to 60 in three seconds. You find out these things, okay? And that's cool to know because if you've been a Prius this whole time driving on off-road and you start moving your Prius back to the highway and you're charging it frequently instead of trying to put diesel in it, you're going to get a lot (laughs) further in life. And that's the beauty with genetics is you start figuring out exactly how your genes like to operate 
Because when you see that you have MTGFR, a, a significant variant, it's like, I need to eat leafy greens, I must avoid folic acid. And then you get another gene that's NOS3, and it's homozygous. And you're like, wow, that explains a lot behind the cardiovascular risk in my family, the MTGFR and the NOS3. I really need to take care. How do I do that? Well, that gene gets dirty really, really quickly. I need to figure out how to support it and what it really needs and what it loves to do and what it doesn't want me to do. And so you start figuring these things out and you can take action on it. And you need to find out that the actionable steps are the fundamentals, but they're fundamentals tweaked. Mm -hmm. And that's the beautiful thing is because you, you're already practicing the fundamentals, or at least you should be, because no supplement is going to cure you 100%, far from. A supplement is, is defined to add or enhance, and the fundamentals take precedence. Well, I, that's why I've loved your approach, because you, you see supplements as just that. They're supplemental to mm -hmm. your good lifestyle choices. They help get you there and keep you there if you need to be. But it's really, if you're not doing all the other homework on the back end, it doesn't really matter. No. You know, Ben, in, in medicine, we, we have these bell-shaped curves of normal that are our average ranges, and we kind of regress individuals to the mean of a population because it's easy for us. And we want everybody to fit in this certain narrow range. We all see people who are outliers that don't fit in those ranges and they need this special attention. Do you feel like looking at the genes is really a way to help understand why you're an outlier or why you need more sleep than your best friend does or why you can't have coffee and they can, they can have a triple latte at dinner, but you can't. It helps you understand some of these things about yourself. A thousand percent. That's, that's the beauty of genetic testing. So let's say that you have been practicing the fundamentals and you've been doing a really thorough job. I mean, not kind of thorough, but very thorough. Yet you are still that person that drinks green tea. And why is everybody loving green tea? Because it makes you super, super anxious yeah. and you just can't tolerate it. Yet your partner is sucking down three cups a day and gentle as a lamb you're like what the heck and you know you've always been kind of a night owl and more of an introvert and that they're really outgoing and they're always trying to drag you to these events and you're like man i just want to stay home so your genes are built like this potentially and when you do genetic testing you can find these things out when you're under the care of someone who truly understands them but 100 percent. so for me i basically had lifelong low white blood cells. Hmm. Every time my doctor, uh, you know, or I go to the doctor, I would see WBCs and they wouldn't be super low, but it would have an L and I'd, I'm like, dang it. What is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? And I did not know that that was connected to methylation and mg 2 mm -hmm. And so, and me not consuming my leafy veggies and I was not even really taking supplements and now my white blood cells are fine they're it's been gone and i remember when i was asking the doctor I said what is up with this doc they keep coming back with an l and my, my doctor was a naturopath and he's like well some people are just outliers and i didn't like that comment <laughs> <laughs> so we, we see a lot of people with low white blood cells and we don't yeah. really have a great answer and we do the medical evaluation looking to be sure it's not a leukemia or something scary but uh and then we try to blame a nutrient deficiency but what you're telling me is that for a lot of these people, it's actually in their genes. It couldn't, it can be, or the genes just aren't working ideally. I did not love uh, and respect my genes. I just, you know, I was a kid, I was a, you know, twenties and, and I was a teen and, and, and then in my twenties and late twenties. And I just, you know, I was impenetrable. I, I do what I want and when I wanted and uh, you know, alcohol, I could never tolerate. And that was one thing that I learned pretty quickly in college is, my friends could drink and I couldn't and uh, I'm not built for alcohol and my genetics just don't, they just say no. Mm -hmm. And so even if I drink uh, one drink, I'm a bit slower the next day. It's harder for me to get going in the morning. So I just don't drink anymore. Smart. And it was just a choice that I made. And you know, it's, yeah, I could supplement my way out of it, but it just really, really slows me down. And, I can have a good time at, at a gathering and not feel pressured to have to drink. 
So if I did feel pressure to have to drink, then that's not my circle of friends. So, you know, Ben, that's such a great point. And I think a lot of um, viewers listening are, can relate to that. Uh, a, a lot of times it's like we mentioned with the coffee, you, you know, you can't one alcoholic drink and you're hung over the next day. Mm -hmm. You can't have coffee after 10 AM or you're wired all night. Right. When you put gas in the car, you can't stand by the car. You have to go off into a clear open ventilated area. When there's a woman with heavy perfume on the elevator, you can't get on it. You have to take the next one. Right. These are all kind of little pearls that tell people that they aren't as efficient with their genes or that they may have some of these dirty genes. Mm -hmm. Are there other pearls that you hear people say that you kind of go, oh, aha, it's one of these? Yeah, I love the cold hands. Hmm. The cold hands, I mean, my hands are warm right now, but I used to have pretty cold hands, and my middle boy, Matthew, will have freezing ice hands. Hmm. And when I was listening to uh, Patrick McEwen mm -hmm. uh, of The Oxygen Advantage, I think he wrote that book, and he talked about nose breathing versus mouth breathing. And this is super important for cardiovascular disease. If you are a mouth breather, you're, you are not producing nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, right. you need to make your blood vessels widen. And when your blood vessels widen, you can deliver blood flow to various areas. When you breathe through your nose, for some reason, the passage of the air through your nose will stimulate the genes to produce nitric oxide and they will widen and have your uh, blood flow. So if you have really cold hands and feet, that's a cardiovascular risk disease uh, susceptibility. Mm -hmm. If you are a mouth breather, that's a cardiovascular risk susceptibility. So next time you find yourself going like this, you know, or your kid or your loved one say, hey, you know, I just learned that you should be breathing through your nose. How are your hands right now? And you feel them like, oh yeah, they're ice. So focus on breathing through your nose just for five minutes, not fast, slowly, slowly in. And you shouldn't even really feel the air going in or out of your nose. It should be nice and slow and in, but not to the point where you freak out and get nervous about breathing and your hands will warm up that fast. It's right. amazing. I have three clients I want to try that with, three women that really suffer from that. It would be yeah, breathing is, an un breathing is an underrated thing because it's automatic. And, but we, we take it for granted because it's autonomic. So let's, we, we got to, as clinicians and as, you know, humans ourselves, you know, there's something called email apnea too. You, if you find yourself holding your breath or sometimes going, you know, all of a sudden just breathing really deeply, you've been holding your breath. So next time you, if you're yawning a lot, have this huge influx of air for a big breathe in or a sigh, you're holding your breath. That tells you that your, your nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic are not balanced. Exactly. Well said. So, you know, one of my favorite things, and I think if I went back, I'd probably be a naturopath as well, is that you're taught and you um, have learned and, and learned yourself to be very observational of the body. You listen to people, you look at people. Are there things that you can see in the physical exam or a nutritional phys physical exam that you do that you see pearls? They give you hints things may not be operating at full efficiency, Ben? Yeah, a lot. Um, so nails. Uh, nails should be uh, strong, not brittle. You should have half moons in your nails. Um, you know, I should probably shouldn't use the middle finger. <laughs> um, so you should see half moons there. Um, and they shouldn't be, you know, curved down. Uh, you shouldn't see a lot of fungus there. Um, the skin shouldn't be splotchy. Uh, the tongue, when you lift the tongue under, you should not see big distended veins. If you see big distended veins, then there's, there's uh, a lot of back pressure. And back pressure can be a congested liver. It can be just congested blood flow. And then what you typically see with the distended veins under the tongue is if you lift your tongue, you'll see the veins under there. And you'll see them. They'll be big and puffy and blue if they're distended. And then you look at your face and it's like might have a purplish hue to it. And women like that will have clotting, they'll have menstrual pain, they'll have PMS, and they'll be quick to irritability. And so when, you, when I ask these two things, I said, lift up your tongue, please. And I look at their hand, I hold their hands, and I ask them, do you have clotting with menses? And they're like, whoa. And are you quick to being irritable? Wow. 
are you slow to calm down and you know all these things and they're like wow that's that's pretty powerful um so yeah there's a ton of these things cold hands um uh how they're positioned when they're sitting are they leaning really far forward right if they're leaning really far forward they might have difficulty breathing and all these huh. muscles might be super tight so they're actually reducing the you know the strain you know are they breathing up here versus down here um you know are the is there this uh, color of their skin modeled, you know, kind of white or dark colored, and again, lack of blood flow. Um, you know, is their neck twisted? You know, my neck is kind of turned, uh, it's kind of pulled down right here, right? A little bit. And I have to do that to straighten it. And that's muscular because I'm, I'm really tight here. So look at their gait. So there's a ton of things. Well, that observational medicine, I think the, the, you've actually just taught me several pearls that I've not heard before. And it, I feel like I'm very observational in my visits, but it's, that makes me even want to look at other things too. I, I don't think I, I, I appreciate the breathing. And it's funny you say that about the breathing because I teach everybody to meditate. And so mm. what we tell them to do is put their right hand on their belly, take a few belly breaths and they all lift their shoulders. And then right. we tell them to breathe out with their belly. We have them do it three times in and out. And I tell them, well, guess what? You just meditated. It's that easy. Do it with every meal. Get the mm-hmm. body ready, and and so it doesn't take a lot of work. You don't have to sit in your underwear for an hour to to get that benefit. Are there are, are there ways that you can assess this genetically that someone's more predisposed to these type of um, nervous system imbalances? And where I'm leading to, Ben, is I'd love to talk about if you if we we could genes and anxiety and genes and ADD because ADD is such a rampant. Um, condition going on. And then so many women deal with anxiety and, and the solutions for both of them are not very good in the medical world. The naturopathic is a lot safer and I think more effective, but uh, I think, no, that's a real burden on our kids and on, on all of us. Um, Yeah, it is. And it's, that's, you know, and the dirty genes here is really, really impactful. They did a study where they, uh, I don't know the exact how the study was made, but the bottom line was organophosphates uh, are very, very prevalent in fruits and vegetables. And they're, they're a compound that's sprayed in, in the fields. And they found that children who ate strawberries that were not organic were way more likely to be ADHD than children who ate strawberries that were organic. So just the, the chemicals that we are all exposed to will increase our susceptibility to this big time. And why is that? Well, organophosphates are a compound uh, that require our genes to stop what they're doing, to pull it, to process it and get it out of the body. So if I had, you know, you know, I'm talking with you now, but my kid came in, you know, with a, a bleeding broken arm, I'd be going to deal with that. So, you know, the, the body wants to rest and repair and regenerate, but if it has to deal with something like organophosphates, it's going to do that. And it's going to run you at a risk for your neurotransmitters not to work very well. And that's, that's what we're exposed to. So you've got to do these simple things because your genes, they can't do two things at once. They, they got to choose. So you, you eat non-organic foods or you want to think clearly. That's a choice. And um, that, it's uh, that simple. It's that simple. Yeah, it's that's that simple. We, we've heard a lot on this series about uh, toxicity and organophosphates and mood issues. And uh, as, as much as I don't want to admit how big a deal toxicity is, because it scares me to think how many people are affected and how woefully ill-equipped so many people are to detoxify. So once mm-hmm. you get things like organophosphates, they're in you for 15, 20 years. So. Yeah. And genetically, you may be less likely to get rid of them. Is that correct? Absolutely. And I, I don't know the, the, the exact pathway for organophosphate elimination. Um, there is a gene called PON1, uh, it's peroxinase 1. And this gene also works with a compound called homocysteine thiolactone, which is a very, very reactive component of homocysteine. And it can lead to seizures and, and so on. And if you're homozygous for 
this PO1 gene. I don't talk about it in my book, and not many people talk about it at all, actually. Yeah, I don't know it. I've not heard yeah, about it. Yeah, it's, um, but if you're homozygous for it, you better be avoiding organophosphates. And Matthew, my middle boy, is homozygous. Hmm. And this gene is associated with autism risk. Dr. Rich, uh, Robert Navio uh, talks about PON1 and his research. Um, so PON1 is a big one, and uh, it is tied to cardiovascular disease as well. Yeah. Now I know that you're right. Now I know what you're talking about. So if, not to share personal information, but if your son has that home, like, uh, besides getting organic strawberries, what are some of the other things that as a family you guys do to be absolutely sure you minimize the exposure to that? Boy, it's a lot of, it's a lot of me being the bad guy, you know? And uh, so it's, you know, you, you go to, it's, it's teaching the kids too and empowering them to make choices. So I was very authoritarian as my, when my kids were young. It was like, no, you're not eating that, and that was that. Now that they're older, my job is to teach them, yes. you know, this is what happens if you eat it, and I do not recommend it. Your choice now. You know, your choice now. I'm not authoritarian <laughs> as much. <laughs> uh, uh, but I... I let them make these choices because I want them to fail in my own home. So if they fail in my own home and they do end up getting ADHD or, you know, sicker, I was like, well, let's go back. Let's backtrack. What happened? What mm -hmm. choices did you make? And I, I use that as lessons for them. It's like, oh yeah. And then they get it. And the next time when the offer comes up, you know, to have strawberries at a party, they're like, you know, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Because they might be, they might have a, a sporting event the next day. So let me give you an example. Uh, my nice. oldest son, uh, Tasman, good looking, tall kid, fit, athlete, um, you know, smart, and just, just an awesome boy. And he's almost 16, and he loves Chick-fil-A. Loves Chick-fil-A. I was that authoritative parent most of his life. And I was like, no, they didn't even know what McDonald's was. Somebody asked them what McDonald's was, and I think they went to four or five, and they asked, what's McDonald's? <laughs> and so he's been eating Chick-fil-A periodically, and he gets zits all over his face. And he goes, Dad, you know, well, I got zits. And I didn't know he was going to Chick-fil-A, because you'd sucker his mom into after soccer practice. <laughs> so we would give him some liver support, zits would go away. And he was like, oh, sweet. I can have my cake and eat it too. So what did he do? He had more Chick-fil-A. The supplement couldn't compete with it. So now he had zits all over and he's like, the supplement doesn't work. I was like, no, you're eating too much. <laughs> you can't, it can't handle it. So his skin was really clean on homecoming. He was zit free. As a teenage boy, zit free. And I, I said, like, Taz, you're, because I saw a photo of him from, uh, from homecoming and I was there. I didn't even really pay attention, but his complexion was super clear and and he goes, God, I'm so excited. Now I can have Chick-fil-A. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I avoided fast food and all junk food for two weeks so I could have a clean complexion for homecoming. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> so even with the best information, we still sometimes make not the best choices. That's right. Because, you know, how much pain is it going to cause you? Well, I don't want zits for homecoming. I'm okay with having a periodic zit you know, walking down the halls of school on a normal day. So, you know, and that's, that's okay. You know, so, you know, that's, you know, if you, now if you're being treated for cancer and you're still smoking, you know, maybe you do want to die and that's okay. But if you don't, then, you know, it's your choice. You know, Ben, the very first time I did a genetic test in my practice was 20 years ago, uh, a woman whose mother had Alzheimer's and she'd read about the APOE gene and wanted to know what her status was. And I'm going to say mistakenly, I ordered it for her, and it came back as one of the two being the bad one. It was mm -hmm. a three, four. You don't right. want the four, four you want, and you don't really want a three, four, but she had the three, four and she immediately felt like she was doomed to get Alzheimer's and there was nothing she could do on it. And she was on the highway to dementia. And I felt helpless as a practitioner you know, I had all these other things we could work on, but she was so focused that her destiny was her gene. Yeah. I didn't have this epigenetic knowledge that we do now. And I, I felt helpless as a, right. as a practitioner for her. Now that we have this information and you can make these, these good decisions, where do people turn to? 
Should they be doing these tests on their own? Do they find a practitioner? How do you know if someone really knows what they're doing with this? Is there any way for our viewers to have some confidence in who they choose to help them with this? That's an awesome question. And I, I learned the answer to that from one of my folks in our Facebook groups. I did not know how to answer this question. And this lady, she, somebody asked this, you know, Dr. Lynch has taught all these doctors, how do I know which one of them are good? And this lady goes, well, you just ask them how they treat empty Jafar. And if they say, well, knowing that empty Jafar is, you know, very useful information, but let's look at, you know, their whole, whole rest of you. That's a good doctor. That's great. If they say, well, you know, we'll, we'll look at your empty Jafar and your other genes and we'll figure out which supplements to put you on according to that. That's a doctor to stay away from. So if they look at, at genetics as susceptibilities versus diagnostic things to, to treat, that's, that's the differentiation. So if a doctor wants to fix your genes by giving you a supplement or a medication, 99 times out of 100, that's the wrong thing to do. Sometimes there are SNPs that you know, do say that, yes, you should have a, a nutrient for that, you know, or at least a special form all the time. Like, you know, FUT2 uh, is a bifidobacter uh, problem. So if you're F FUT2, you're a non-secretor and you probably should be taking prebiotics and, and bifidobacter probiotics just point blank. You just, you just take them. So that's one of those rare genes. And I don't talk about that yet publicly. Um, so there you go, firsthand. Um, <laughs> but uh, most of the time, that's how you, f you figure it out. And I think that was a great, great way to do it. You know, you brought up two great points, Ben. One is, uh, I love when our clients teach us something. Yeah. You know, and these Facebook groups and the kind of work you're doing with that, I love that. I think that's, these forums to share are so powerful. And, and the way women share with each other is just, it's, it's beautiful. It's great how they help each other and support each other. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. When I, I have people come to me for second opinions or, or they call me, like they do Mark Hyman, the doctor of last resort because I live in this resort capital. But they've been to 12 doctors and they're coming to us. And they're ready to give up. Yeah. But when I see these genetic reports and one thing circled in a supplement ready, written right next to it, I know right away that that was probably not the most optimal practitioner for that person to see right. because it's a, it's a lock and a key mechanism, not a pathway and a journey that they take together. So I, I love that answer because it's, it's really, a, it's a journey and it's not a, if this, then that it's more, it's not as, um, as binary. It's, it's more of the, it's the art of medicine. Who it really is the art. And we're, you know, there was, there was a great comic, um, and it was alarming, but true. They basically it had a curve of access to information skyrocketing going up this way. And we have tremendous access to information right now with you. Like for example, with your summit, people are getting tremendous value and tremendous information from this that would have taken forever to be able to <laughs> gather in the past, right? Way in, impossible. Now it's just right there on their phone. Amazing. But the access to common, the ability to practice common sense <laughs> is inverse, directly inverse. And the tag, the, the punchline at the bottom is that we're going to be the most well-informed instinct species on the planet. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, you have the amount of predatory stuff that's going on in terms of when there's a pain point, there's always going to be someone there to solve your pain with something. And a lot of people will do it the quick way, which isn't the right way. Mm -hmm. And they'll make a lot of money from it. And they're thinking of the short term gain, not the long game. And if you're the individual who's thinking the short game, then you are supporting these predatory type companies of which there are many. So if you're, if you're getting a genetic test and a genetic report, and it says that you have this genetic variant, take this supplement and this supplement, only you have this one, take this supplement and this supplement, and there's supplement companies doing the same thing. Big name supplement companies are saying, upload your 23andMe data for free, and we'll tell you what supplements to prescribe to your patients, and they're teaching doctors this. And you know that's, that's why I would say this is my biggest, you say what's one of your biggest hurdles? 
this is one of my biggest hurdles because this, the amount of misinformation, the lack of common sense, and doctors also want fast because they're busy. Sure. And it's, it's, you know, it, it's tough. And you've got to be, as your own self, as a patient, you have to be educated. So I love that you're putting the summit together to be able to provide individuals that information. So when a doctor does that, it's like, thank you very much. Out you go. You're done. They're fired. <laughs> Well, sometimes you do have to fire your practitioner and yeah. start over and find one. And, and finding good ones are hard. Uh, yep. Just keep going, ones. though. You got to keep going. You know, it's interesting. I think we were able to make an atomic bomb in our country before we actually cracked the code on DNA. And what was it, 15 years ago, it was $10 million to sequence your DNA, and now it's under $1,000 to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this technology and this information is blossoming so fast. Ben, what, where do you think this is headed? Are we, are we close? Or, or where, where do you see this all going as far as how we use genetics to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis for our healthy lifestyle? Well, you're asking a naturopathic physician, and my ideal future of this, of genetic testing, is prevention. Yes. So if we understand truly of what genetics mean, and what their functions are, and we can tell people from an early, early time frame, i.e. prior to getting pregnant, so they can optimize their unborn child with the right nutrients and their, their own choices, so that baby will be born into the world because they've got, you know, the future mom and dad have genes which increase various risks for deficiencies or increase risks of various chemicals, or they shouldn't take certain medications at all, and then they, they know this information is like, oh, wow, yeah, I'm low on that nutrient. Yeah, I'm taking those meds right now. And yeah, I want to get pregnant. And then they fix all that. And then they get pregnant. That kid's genes are going to be superior um, because they're going to be a lot cleaner and they're going to have the right tools. And that baby is going to be more, uh, you know, apt to sustain themselves in an otherwise potentially, well, very polluted environment. So I think when that happens that's gonna be really cool also i think it'll be great for occupational choice it's mm -hmm. not what do you want to do for your for a living it's like how are my genes you know built what am i best for so for example uh, we talked about adhd so individuals who are more prone to adhd of the type of lack of focus um, because they don't have enough dopamine in their brain these types of people are risk takers and they perform fantastic in high pressure situations. Surgeons, ER docs, firemen, fire, you know, fire women, they excel in high pressure situations. They can handle the stress because when the stress comes, now they got the right amount of dopamine in their brain. If I was in that role, I would have excessive amounts of dopamine in my brain and I would freak out. <laughs> so, you know, it's, I'm no ER doc. Okay. And when I looked at my genes, I was like, that explains it. Hmm. My middle boy or my oldest Tasman, he has genes increased risk for ADHD. He's a daredevil when it comes to sports. He's like, Hey dad, follow me. And we're skiing. <laughs> and I look down, I'm like, hell no. <laughs> it's like that, you know? And uh, Matthew and I are both looking down there and Matthew and I's jeans are the same. And we're looking at each other and like, how did he just do that? <laughs> and I said, Matthew, he's got more dopamine than you and I uh, now. And if we went down there, we would have excessive amounts. So, you know, it's, that's where I see it going. You know, listening to you talk, Ben, I like your cartoon analogy, as our toxic environment goes up, our knowledge of how to decrease that pain may go down to find an optimal level because we had Joe Pizzorno in our conversation the other day talking about the organophosphates and breast milk and how it lowers the IQ of kids. Yeah. And you can really build a story of how this, as a civilization, we're really kind of starting to circle down because of this toxic burden on all of us. Big time. As, as we understand, I love your, your story, your metaphor, but as we understand how to build the nest healthier, and you know, help women provide this environment around them and in them to nurture the child right for their genes, their child's genes may actually be healthier or cleaner. Yes. And I, that's an exciting message, I think, for everyone listening, that that's possible. 
Yeah, you, you, you increase resiliency. You know, I mean, think of a, of a rubber band, you know, a brand new rubber band that's about a half inch thick. Mm -hmm. You know, you can pull it and it's pretty resilient. It'll come back. Now, if you take that same half inch rubber band and it's set out in the sun for a long time, it's starting to fray around the edges, you know, and that was the first time you got it and you bought it at the store, you'd be like, hey, give me a new one. But a lot of our babies and our kids are being born already frayed and tattered. And then we wonder why when we give them, uh, you know, we put them in cribs with, you know, mattresses that are off-gassing, paint and carpets that are off-gassing, uh, folate, uh, formaldehyde, you know, folic acid uh, formulas, and, you know, vaccine schedules that are super, super aggressive. And they're already vitamin D deficient because the mom was inside all the time and not outside and, you know, wasn't absorbing her, you know, fats. So that baby was already weaker. So just start thinking of it that way. And, you know, your choices really, really, really matter. Well, Ben, I, I've always enjoyed listening to you as a speaker. You're, you're a teacher of doctors. You're a teacher of patients. You're a teacher of, of really everybody in a concept that's it's, even as an educated physician who works hard, this is still a difficult subject for me. And you, you make it easy. I love the way you explain these. For all of our viewers, if they wanted to connect with you and learn more about the work you're doing, how do they find you? How do they learn more about this? Well, I think the best places are Facebook and my Instagram. And, uh, you know, drbenlynch.com can take you to the both, both of those places. My kids say, Dad, your Instagram feed sucks. Uh, you know, <laughs> so what? It's, like it's, it's, it's not pretty pictures on my feed. It's informational sorry you know you want pretty pictures sub to nat geo travel or something <laughs> you know or watch your summit and see those beautiful mountains behind you. <laughs> and ben, what, what are you excited about next what are you what's on your learning plate where do you where are you going next with all this creating continuing to create tools that make it actionable you know Love continue it. to create tools that where people actually can get their genetic information and apply it and experience results and having targeted recommendations based upon that, that are complete. There's too much focus on just single genetic variations like MTHFR or NOS3 or PON1. But what happens when you have all three, right? What happens if you have all three of those? Then your increased susceptibility for cardiovascular disease is even higher. So, what my role is doing now is, is we're creating our own genetic chip and we're, we're going to be creating reports that are, you know, focused on combinations of genes and then putting tons of lifestyle actionable information in there. So, for example, cardiovascular risk, we'll have a cardiovascular risk panel and people will have all the genes there and we'll have the actionable steps. So people will see their own susceptibility to that and labs and all these other things. And it's, it's not going to be a supplement mill by any means. And uh, in fact, we probably won't even recommend supplements. We'll talk about nutrients, but we won't mm -hmm. talk about supplements. So, and optimizing lives of unborn children is definitely my passion. So continuing to work to optimize pregnancies is uh, where I'm going. You know, that's been a common theme throughout the series is, is how to really optimize that and it helps us and it really helps the next generation. And I think for all of us, I know yourself included, that's our big passion is how do we make it a better place and have more knowledge for those to come. 100%. Dr. Ben, Dr. Ben Lynch, uh, again, my appreciation and gratitude is huge. I loved having you today and thank you so much for being here. Pleasure, Mark. Thanks for the invite.